Well, Fruits Basket came out early. And oh boy, what an episode. It wasn't just a recap either like I thought it would be. I thought it might be like reintroduce the story of the world of characters. Get us ready for season three. But no, we jumped right into season three. So much happened. So many feelings. So many crazy ideas I have now that I have to make a video about it. This video might be kind of rambling. Also, it's going to spoil the episode. So go away if you don't want that. Actually, really, go away if you haven't seen the episode. Go watch the episode, then come back here because, well, it's good. It's also only in the dub as of the last time I checked, which is kind of weird. But the dub's good, so I won't complain. Also, I wrote this script, but I'm, I'm also kind of going on my ramble, so we will see how this goes. So yeah, it was amazing. So many episodes, and I actually felt bad for Akito, which I didn't think was possible. There was only like a kind of short scene that did it, just a little bit of backstory. And what I love about Fruits Basket is how it really delves into the character's trauma, how it affects them, how it makes them the way that they are. With Toru, we see a chain of kindness, how the love she shares with others impacts them, changes them, all for the better. And now with Akito, we see the opposite, though it was also here in that same way. Akito has hurt so many of the cast, physically, emotionally, but this episode showed that, in fact, she is also a victim of trauma like all the other characters. Which really it makes sense. And the perpetrator of her trauma was her own mother, Ren, not Reen. That's going to get confusing. I apologize if I mix up those characters' names. Anyway, one of the things that I thought was really interesting here is how it builds on the parallels between Toru and Akito. They were both young girls on opposite paths. Toru was instilled with kindness from a young age from her mother, and she spreads this love to everyone around her. But she doesn't think anything of herself. Akito is the opposite. She sees herself as the only one that matters, and while she does sort of love the Zodiac around her, it's a twisted, self-serving type of love. Actually, that's another parallel with Toru and Akito, too, because Toru's love is also twisted, but in a selfless way. Like with Kurano, Toru feels that she failed Kurano and Uo here, and because of that, because she wasn't able to help them. And therefore, it was all her fault. Toru's love is so beautiful and powerful, and I want to be like Toru. But her selfless love can only go so far before she is broken by it, and we started to see that here. Hana points out how irresponsible it is for Toru to carry all, all these burdens. And because Hana knows what that is like, she has felt the voices of everyone, all their emotions through her waves from a young age, and she knows what it's like to be overwhelmed by everyone's problems. And this is where the parallels between Toru and Akito are so fascinating. Because, okay, this is going to sound strange, but Toru needs to learn something from Akito. She needs to consider herself in these moments. Yes, she should continue to reach out to others, be kind, help them, hug them, love them, all that. Very good. But she also needs to take the time when it is right to pull back, to consider herself and, and let herself rest and be loved. And that is the one place where Akito is right. Akito allows herself to feel the love from the other Zodiac members. Yes, it's a twisted love, for sure. But take away the twisted nature of it, and there's actually good within it. Akito loves spending time with the other Zodiac. She loves making them care about her. And yes, she's in a way projecting, but in a way that's how love between people should be. They should have the connection where they support each other. And that's what makes Akito such a good villain, is that her villainy stems from a human desire we all have, which is simply to be loved. That is, in fact, what Fruits Basket is all about, to be loved. And Akito fears losing this love because that's human. I don't want to lose the love of my friends and family, and this is further complicated for Akito by the Zodiac curse, and how all the Zodiac are forced to be loyal. So in a way, the love is there, but it's not true love, because true love cannot be coerced. Ren even calls it a fake love. Still, Akito feels that, and she wants that because that is what she has always had. And in a way, this false love is blinding her to the true love that she could have if she let go of all the pain and suffering and trauma and love the Zodiac, not as Zodiacs, but as people. And like, she has that with Kurino, but she doesn't realize it. And again, that's one of the fascinating parts about Kurino is how he is the one member of the Zodiac who's broken free of the curse. He doesn't have to be loyal to Akito, 
but he still is. And not to the Akito that's the god of the zodiac, but to the Akito that is just a person. Well, all the other members of the Zodiac seem to resent Akito with their human side, but their Zodiac compels them to serve. So again, it's the opposite parallel here, how Akito has been hurt, and, and that causes her to hurt others, while Teru, she's been loved so deeply, and that compels her to love others, which causes the members of the Zodiac to love Teru, not as a Zodiac, but, of, but as the people that they are. Does that make any sense? I hope so. I was definitely rambling when I wrote this script. And I'm going off script here, which is even worse for making sense. But yeah, there's so much here. And that's not even talking about the part with Hana in this episode, which is just amazing. In part because, well, it's Hana, and Hana is amazing. But she did amazing things here. I loved how she was just here for Toru. She even announced that she was here to save the day. And her wave powers helped her to find Toru, since that she was in pain, which was great. One of the things I think is really cool is how much of a contrast this is to Hana's backstory, where her way powers caused her so much pain and suffering and even nearly killed a guy. But because of the change she's been through, her way powers are now able to help her to help a friend. And what I love about Hana is that she's not really a good, kind person. You should not admire Hana. I mean, I think she's cool, but I don't want to be like Hana the way I do with Toru. And, like, she's when her mother was asking what she should make for Toru, Hana just mentioned her favorite food. As in Hana's favorite food, not Toru's favorite food. Because Hana is great. And a bit self selfish, but I think that's okay. But what is great about Hana is that when she needs to be, she's fiercely loyal to those that she cares about. And given what she's been through, it makes sense. Hana is not someone who would make friends easily. We saw that in her backstory. And that is why she cares about Toru so much, because that is one of the few friends she truly has made. And then I love how she called it a nightgown festival instead of a pajama party, and then her line about what they were doing and how that could be taken several different ways. Now, yes, this is hilarious, but from a story structure perspective, it really helped like divide the episode, splitting the really sad part with, with Karano and Toru, and then the uplifting part with Toru and her friends. And yeah, I do wonder, did Hana know what she was saying? I think so. It is Hana. <laughs> Especially since it is implied that her love for Toru is not just a completely pure love. I do kind of ship it. And then Ua's scene with Toru was so beautiful as well. And it really represents what I love about the romance and fruits basket. Am I recording? Okay. Good. I'm recording. I, I got worried there for a second. Where was I? I guess. The scene with Uo. How it represents the greatness of the romance and fruits basket. And that's that the romance isn't a point. Yes, finding love is great and all. But the thing about Fruits Pask is that it shows there are many kinds of love and bonds we form in life. Romance being only one of them. And love, romantic love, can be very fleeting. The feelings that Uo and Karno had for each other were very sudden and very powerful. But sometimes things just don't work out for whatever reason. Yeah, that's sad. But that's also life. And this scene shows what is truly important to Uo, and that is her bond with Toru. And now since I keep forgetting stuff, well, because I wrote the rest of this before I saw the episode, I'm going to rewatch it and comment on a few other things that I picked up on. First of all, I love how this episode went back to season one with the banquet of the Zodiac and with God. And how much like weight it gave, how it showed the tragedy of it. It gave me chills. We saw how the banquet was eternal and unchanging and how the Zodiac are bound by the promise. We know this. But what really stood out to me is the difference between the words and the tone. An endless banquet that goes on forever and ever, in a way, sounds great. Like, I would love to spend forever with friends. But there's also a chilling thing here. How it's been corrupted, twisted, as it goes forever, and they're bound by it. And because they're bound, it becomes not a good thing. We also get hints here of Akita's loneliness and her desperation for companionship. And we, and then we saw that Ren nearly caught Toru back when she went to find Kurano, which I also love how that ties Ren back, how she's been in the background for so long, making some very subtle moves, and now to introduce season three, really jumping into it, framing her as a big villain, sort of, though, maybe Akito still will be? I don't know. I, I'm not sure which way I would prefer. 
in a way, I think I wanted to see Akito. Because I feel like that makes the most sense. That is the villain we've seen all along. So having to switch to Ren, I don't think would be as good. But I think it might get into Akito's story too. Her fighting against Ren and what Ren has done to her. And possibly with Toru's help. That would be interesting. And it also works well for the story structure too. With a bigger veil of mysteries around her than Akito. So that just works well to jump into season 3, the big finale where there will be no more secrets by the end. Honestly, that's the perfect way to set it up. And now I'm really excited to see more. Hopefully it won't be too many more weeks. And I also like how Ren also has a twisted love for the Zodiac. Akito pushes her away, violently, physically in fact. And Akito makes a comment too how a parent's love isn't real, which gets to the heart of Fruits Basket. So many of the characters have terrible parents or, or just estranged relationships. In fact, as I was talking about how Fruits Basket de-emphasizes romance, in a way, it also de-emphasizes family. Because in many cases, our families are terrible. But we are still desperate for the love that family provides. And sometimes family are just the worst people to provide that type of love. So Akito is right here. And while she's rejecting the false love of family, she's also clinging to the false love of the Zodiac, which is really fascinating. Like, you can be so right. You can say that this thing is terrible, I hate it, and be right. But that hatred is going to blind you. Hatred is a scary thing. You have to be careful with it. I see it all around in life too, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole tonight. But I could definitely do so though. And something else is fascinating is how Ren sort of has this real love with Akira, her husband. But in a way, that's also false love because he is gone. But Ren is still clinging to that, the past. In another parallel between Toru and Akito, both losing their fathers when they were young. Both fathers really building them up. It's fascinating. Dang, I want more fruits basket. Then we have a flashback to Akira telling Akito that she was born to be loved. Which again, so fascinating. Because we are all like Akito. We are born to be loved. That is written in the DNA of what it means to be human. But Akito has been given this false love, a forced love, and thinks that it's real because she hasn't felt something else. And then Kurno, as the flashback ends, he apologizes, seeing himself as someone who only hurts others. Yeah, I actually didn't write anything else here. But I think it is fitting, especially when you keep in mind what Ua was saying, how Toru and Kurana were the same type of stupid. And what was Toru doing? She was apologizing too, seeing herself as only hurting others and taking from them. So yeah, Toru and Kurana have a lot in common, and I hope we see more of their bond grow too. Then we have Toru's scarf blown away as she's frozen, being overwhelmed. Uh, Reen looks on, not Ren, Reen, and I'm not quite sure what to say about this. Though, I feel like Rain is going to do something big soon. But then we also have Ren encountering Rain, and yeah, that's going to be important. That's also possibly going to be scary. Kind of worried. Completely interesting, though. But I do love how Kyo found Toru's scarf, as Hana was talking about how everything would overwhelm Toru. This is so cool because the juxtaposition of the scenes gives an answer to what Hana is saying. Toru on her own will allow herself to be overwhelmed. But she needs Kyo, who will basically stop her. Who will basically take care of her when she doesn't even think she needs taken care of. And it's also showing the answer in a bigger picture, too. How to how what she needs to do is just let herself be loved by Kyo and Hana and all the people who love her. And or Uo, too. Like, how Uo ran to Hana's house. Like, rushed her away from work as fast as she could. And that's the type of friend she is. It's a beautiful friendship. I want a friend who would, like, run from their job to come to me if I need it. And it also shows how Uo sees herself as trash for, like, forcing Toru to do this, even though Uo didn't force her. But again, it shows how these great people don't see themselves as great. And Uo says if she can't call herself trash, then Toru cannot call herself useless, which, again, a beautiful moment of friendship. And Megami is great, too. I don't just like him because he shares the same character name as Konosuba, but Megami is great. Plus, he's related to Hana, so I feel like he has to be. And I love how he is saying that it's not all for nothing. And that's Uo's creed, too. And I love this creed. It's kind of my own. <laughs> because that's how I live my life. 
Sure, not everything in my past has been perfect. And I have definitely made mistakes. I've hurt people. I've done the wrong thing many times, in fact. But I don't regret it. Because these choices, these events, they put me in the position that I am and made me the person that I am. I think I got the English wrong there. Whatever. A mistake I'm not going to regret. So, sure, there are things in my past that are gone that I can't get back. But... You know, that's okay. It's not for nothing. Because it has given me a wonderful present and a future I look forward to, even if it is a bit scary. Yeah, I keep loving the Fruits Basket more and more. This episode, or this video might be longer than the episode itself. And I love at the end how Kyo returned the scarf and washed it, but not all the stains came out, which is so fitting. Sometimes when we're hurt, the love of others can take the pain away. But the scars remain. There may even be some lingering pain itself. But it's just like the scarf, you can't wash away all the dirt. But it is the joy of being with others and the love we feel for them that overwhelms the pain and will make us wear a wet scarf because it represents love. Yeah, I'm not sure how to finish that analogy, but I like it. And I love the line that framed the entire season as Terry returns home. It was a quote that just really stood out to me. It was cool. And so let me end the video on that. The sun goes down, but it always comes up again. No matter how dark, no night lasts forever. So I will start again, one step at a time.